Hey girl, Marissa here. You are listening to the Codependent Dummy Podcast. As a young woman, you have been raised, reinforced, and rewarded for putting the needs of others above your own. Now, in your 20s, you're finding yourself exhausted, exasperated, and enveloped in shit relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. Codependency is a way of being where we put the feelings, wants, and needs of others above our own in an unconscious attempt to meet our own feelings, wants, and needs. Sorry to break it to you, sis, but that is not sustainable. This podcast is to help you undo all that so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Coda Pandemic podcast. Today, I am with Lauren Camacho. Lauren is a therapist, coach, and founder of her group practice, A New Counseling and Wellness, located in Covina, California. A New Counseling and Wellness serves adults, teens, and couples and strives to support them in healing, growing, and thriving so they can feel better and live better. Lauren, thank you for coming back to the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll start with the typical two, but since you've already answered them, I'll remind you of what you said and let's (laughs) see if you can expand on it. So, okay. (laughs) <laughs> For how you define codependency, you previously said codependency is taking or giving responsibility to someone or something else in order to meet our needs, whether that's emotionally or psychologically. And you said the key word is responsibility. Any, any thoughts on how, uh, how you want to expand on that? You know, I kind of am in the same ground with it, you know, anything that you're kind of relying on, which is, which is a hard thing sometimes to navigate because sometimes we do need to rely on things and it's important to, right. But I think the overarching thing is, am I relying on it in a way that's actually taking away from myself or not as an effective way as I would like. Right. So, yeah, I think, I think I would stand my ground in that (laughs) definition. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you did say to something like, if we give responsibility to others, we lose a sense of ourselves in the process. Yeah, additional thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, if we're not really getting to know who we are or even finding the values that we live by or fulfill us or really speak to us or even explore to the depths of us who we are and, you know, honor that, um, there's a piece of us that gets lost. Mm -hmm. And I think not even realizing it, how quick that can happen. And, you know, it can happen so easily around people that you love and care for and roles that you have to play because it's not just you, right? There's so many different moving parts and people and we all have to kind of work together and flow together. So it's not necessarily the most easiest things thing at times, but, um, but yeah, I think if you don't have some, a touch point in connecting to yourself and understanding who you are, what you value and how to honor that, there is a piece of our soul. I think that does get lost in, in the way of life. Right. And then for codependence, we tend to, get lost and know who we are through others, right? And honor that. And and so, yeah, we're just, I don't know. I always talk about like being a tumbleweed, just kind of flowing over <laughs> here and getting yeah. stuck over here and wind goes over here, but no, no real root. Yes, mm-hmm. the root is, right, that's the most precious thing. And that's actually what I go towards with the value set. And like, what what do I value? And why do I value it? And even to the extent of what does this value even mean to me? You know, and because it could be so subjective at times and it, the tumbleweed is so beautiful, right? Because yeah, you 
the tumbleweed will go and I'll pick up on things and sometimes unwillingly <laughs> and wanting, wanting to really have it. But at the same time, it can be a beautiful aspect too, because you get glimpses and insights into other possibilities. But if you don't come back with those possibilities into something that you're grounded in, like your foundation, then you're just going to try to wing it. And that's never really an effective route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, our second Typical two question, is there a codependent or experience um, experience or relationship from your own life that you can share with us? And yeah, previously you said, I would say I'm a recovering people pleaser. And yeah, you talked about your codependency in young motherhood when you were taking on all the responsibilities and having a hard time asking for help from family. Do you want to share more about that or another experience or relationship in your own life? Gosh, I think parenthood will always bring up things for you. You, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you. It's definitely a very vulnerable role in such a beautiful way. But, um, yeah. you know, I think what resonates with me in that is, um, you know, every time I transition into another, lack of a better way to say it, another level or a growing point in my life or a transition, mm -hmm. I, I am faced with, okay, like how, how am I going to be in this now? Like, what do I, who do I need to be? Not in a, um, changing complete identity way, but in the sense of like, what is this moment calling forth of me? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I need to access within myself? And, um, sometimes those growing moments are very scary and vulnerable. You know, when I had made my group practice in new counseling and wellness, um, I think that's definitely the last transition that I've made and definitely constantly had to come in and kind of put my head down, if you will, and go, okay, this is all new. I'm learning. I'm asking people tons of questions, which is a good thing, you know, especially new territory. And based off of everything that I'm learning and all the input that I'm getting, like, how do I want to proceed moving forward? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in that space, I'm noticing the fears and the worries and the questioning of myself and because it's unknown, right. I don't know it until I kind of go through it. And so I think I, I definitely feel bits and pieces of it. And I don't know if it's a hundred percent bad, you know, I think it's just more I'm exploring and navigating and moving through. Can you think of a quintessential, like, oh, this was Lauren leaning into her codependency during this transition? Yeah, when I'm like, hey, decide for me, please. Mm. You know, this is, this feels too big of a thing to answer by myself. Right. And I don't want to, again, going back to that word responsibility, I don't want to take responsibility of this. Can someone else do it for me? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, yeah, I think, I think the worry of failure is really underlining that, you know, so if someone else can help me with that, maybe I'll uplift that pressure that I have on myself, but gosh, when it comes to big decisions in your life, you're ultimately the one that says yes, no, maybe so. And so I really got to stand behind what I say, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Lauren, decide for me, please. <laughs> I mean, story of my life. I, yeah. I mean, I've talked about it on the show, but I remember being um, at times like very codependent and reliant on my dad. And sometimes like I would call him and ask like what I should eat. Um, <laughs> like, like for lunch, like, should I get this or should I get that? Like, I, yeah, like, please just de decide for me, please. Which was such an innocent choice. And I, I still couldn't, but then yeah, the bigger decisions, yeah, in my own life and like working with my patients, like I can just tell sometimes like, like, yeah, in these transitions, there is, there's this hope that like someone else, someone else please decide. And it's like, no girl, it's all on you ultimately. Yeah. It's all on you. But I think too, it's like, okay, I recognize my pattern in it. Right. And so I think for me, it's like, okay, the pressure I put on myself leads to a lot of overwhelm and the overwhelm makes me kind of freeze. And then that is what that freezing moment of overwhelm makes me go, okay, you over there, like, 
<laughs> what would you do, you know, and decide? Mm-hmm. And, but I realized, okay, I need to rewire that. I need to first understand my pattern. And I, and I did, you know, and, and then go, okay, how do I intervene with myself in these times? For me, I'm like, okay, if it's overwhelm and then I kind of freeze, then I just need to take time and kind of go back and get grounded. And then I need to like, not see it so big. I kind of take, I look at everything all at once, which makes it such a big decision for me. And I feel it, you know? And so for me, if I get grounded and create some space between myself and the situation at hand, and I can go, okay, how can I do this in a bite size Mm -hmm. and, and like work my way up if needed? And I realized, okay, maybe it's not me needing somebody. Maybe it's me just not being grounded and too overwhelmed, mm-hmm. right? And so I've learned how to be with myself and work with myself. You know, I, I'm really big on how do you create a better relationship to what's in front of you, whether if that's a person, a situation, or a problem. And so I kind of see myself in these, if you will, like a codependent uh, moment, I, I see it as, okay, how do I have a better relationship with this overwhelm that I'm experiencing? Because mm-hmm. um, we can't get necessarily get rid of these experiences, but we could definitely form a new relationship and better, more effective one with it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. So in prepping for this interview, yeah, you had some key observations. So that's everyone that's we're going to dive into things that Lauren sees working with her clients and at her group practice. So how have you observed codependency in those feeling lost in their current stage of life? Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of familiar to what we're just talking about. A lot of times in their current stage, it's something just transitioned and something's different. And so they can resort on a way of coping, which I, like I just gave in my example, they can resort to that codependency way, relying on somebody else in a way that's not necessarily the other person's role. Again, go to people, hear them, get their feedback, especially people that, I tell my, my clients, and this was something that was told to me by one of my mentors, find people and and really put them in your arena, you know, and only go to those people in your arena that are trusted and that you really look up to and their wisdom. And this could be people, you know, this is could, could be people that are a podcast, you know, a book a author, you know, so, um, but go to those reliable resources and, and hear their feedback. And then hopefully they can tell you too, like, you know, has some reflecting pieces for you to kind of reflect on and see how you're going to take those pieces. But yeah, you know, in my practice, I usually see people that are in transition that maybe it's a mom or a dad and their kids just moved out or went to college or had a kid and roles are shifting and changing and Mm -hmm. they don't yet know who they are in this new space. We're not supposed to just know especially if things were a certain way and now they're not like we really have to explore and allow ourselves to be uncomfortable, not knowing until we know. Um, and, and so I think that's the majority of what I do get. Yeah. People in those transitioning moments in their life, kind of not knowing where they are at feeling a little lost and then not knowing the skills and resources on how to figure that out internally speaking. So how do I get clarity in what I need and who I need to be in these moments. Right. And what might their codependency, right beside the deciding for me, please, what other like behaviors or characteristics have you seen people engage in? Um, I mean, the reliance on others, right? Um, but sometimes as we get older, people are also very busy and unable to be that role, right? And so then I think symptoms are like chaos and overwhelm, um, life being very disorganized, kind of, uh, if you will, always being in like a survival mode <laughs> right. kind of state of being. Um, 
I actually see probably more of that, like the symptoms of, of gosh, trying to find, I, well, what I'm trying to say is I, I probably see more of the symptoms of that than actually them like fully being enmeshed in a different type of relationship, like someone taking over decision-making for them and, and being reliant on somebody else. Um, I think that's more of what I see in the younger ages, but as we get a little older, it does definitely change. I mean, I do see it in, in couples work a lot of the time, but more so, yeah, it always leaks out more in the symptoms of what the person is actually experiencing. Yeah. So survival mode, life being disorganized, chaos, overwhelm, reliance on others. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing I think it's just lacking that inner, inner authority. Right. I I feel like the, when it comes to any dynamic, uh, whoever's the most convicted in the room is probably going to win, you know? And so sometimes when we're not convicted about certain things and going back to values again, like if we don't know what values we should be convicted about, we're not really going to have a say or know how to navigate things. Right. And so um, building that inner authority is definitely something that I work with clients on, um, and something that is lacking when they come in and, and could be one of those things of codependency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I remember, um, I was fairly codependent with my parents and my dog before I moved out and, so much so that we purchased our home in the month of September and Lauren, I didn't move into our home until January. (laughs) And, um, you know, we were getting work done. We, yeah, there, there were other reasons that contributed, but like September, October, like four whole months. I mean, yeah, this transition. And I was like, mommy, (laughs) <laughs> like I could not let them go and um so yeah I appreciate this highlight of like during the transition um yeah it wasn't like yeah th- there was a foundation already in that dynamic but then I just like really like leaned into it because yeah my role was shifting and changing um And yeah, I didn't know how to find that clarity and like, I didn't know how to make the jump. So I needed four months to do it. And yeah, my dad jokes now, like he, during that time, like he never said anything, but he was, he was worried about my marriage. Like hopefully she moves out because yeah, I had no urgency. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Right. The stalling. and Yeah. Yeah, it can, it can show up in many different ways, but I think that's the beauty in being able to go, wait, what, what is this? You know, what's coming up for me and what skills and resources do I need to navigate through it? And I think that's how like we essentially navigate through it and past it. Um, But yeah, we don't, sometimes we don't even realize like what we're experiencing and the dynamics that we have or attachments, should I say that we have about people or other things or even objects. Right. And you said your dog as well, right. Animals. And until we um, see ourselves in a different role with it or a different in a different space with it. And then we're like, Oh my gosh, this is exposing something within me. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think moments of growth and transition in our life can do that. And again, it could be a very beautiful thing, even though it's overwhelming and it can feel scary because we don't yet have the tools and resources to, to really support us in it yet. Right. Or maybe we do, but we haven't applied it to this particular situation quite yet. And we're not grounded yet. Um, but I, I love, I love that example. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, in your work, what about codependency have you observed causes us to feel detached to ourselves? Yeah. Um, not getting to know ourselves essentially, like not taking the time for reflection. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the first time, but I'll, if I do, I'll repeat it anyways. Um, 
journaling could be a very beautiful avenue to be able to reflect. And it's such a cliche thing for clinicians to say, hey, journal your thoughts and feelings. But I usually use it more in, hey, journal, so you can get to understand what's happening within you and what you need and how do you how to navigate what you need. Um, I usually ask clients to, if they're kind of questioning or have this kind of thing as a issue for them, I'll say, reflect every day and, and have a couple questions to reflect on first. Like, how am I like, what's your experience, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, like situationally, um, where you're feeling it like within your body. Cause a lot of times one can not be even connected to their body. And if you're not connected to your body, there's something not aligned, right? We have to understand us on an emotional level, a mental level and a physical level. Mm-hmm. You know, we want, we want to be able, and that goes to even our thoughts, our behaviors and our beliefs. Like we want them to be aligned as well. And so um, when you ask yourself, like, where is that in my body? It can help with that as well. And then also, what do I need? And that is another question. So what do I need in this situation? It gets them to problem solve that's directly connected to their current experience. And then the fourth question, how do I meet that need? Or how do I get that resource to meet that need? Um, Again, it's not something that people probably know off the bat a lot of the time, but it has them questioning it. And uh, you just want to start questioning it until it becomes a familiar thing. So you can answer it very organically. Sometimes it's very organic for people to answer these things. And for others, it is not and it takes them a long time. And sometimes the response is, I don't know. And uh, I don't know if you've experienced this in your sh- sessions with people, but sometimes when people say, I don't know, I say, well, if you did know, what, what would you do? Or what would you say? And they respond. And it's a lot of the times it's not that they don't know. Sometimes it is, and that's okay. We're not going to know everything, right? But sometimes it's more of a, I haven't allowed myself the opportunity to really answer things. So a coping style is shut down. No, I don't know. And so take a moment, pause, and then answer, lean in, move forward. Um, So I really like that technique, the journaling to really help support that. Um, It's definitely something if if you can allow yourself to sit down and write, because sometimes who the heck has time for that? But sometimes we definitely have to make the time. And that's the problem. We got to make the time to understand and get to know ourselves Like you're not going to go and just marry someone without going on a date. You know, like you got to know your husband by getting to know him, by asking him questions, by seeing the depths of his soul and going, you know, I think I could be with this guy for a little while, you know? And, and for us, we have to get to know ourselves on that level as well. Mm -hmm. That, that comes with questioning and spending some time, you know, so give yourself five minutes, a couple minutes a day to do so. Right. And this sounds so, I mean, I don't mean to emphasize so. This sounds basic. It sounds doable. And at the same time, I remember when I first started journaling as a codependent, like I still had other people's opinion in my mind, like on how I was journaling. Or like, oh, I'm like pleasing all the journaling gods. (laughs) Like it just, it's so entrenched. It's so pervasive. And so, yeah, I think um, it can be difficult in different ways. So so maybe you might have difficulty answering the questions or yeah, I feel like, like I, I'd be journaling. I'm like, oh, my therapist will be so proud and the journaling gods and whoever. So like my codependency was present, even in the act of trying to attach and get to know myself. Um, yeah. And like, like you said, sometimes you can go through these questions and put, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But then trying to like go one level deeper. Okay. If I did know how, how am I mentally, emotionally, physically, situationally? Um, any other thoughts on how like basic these questions sound, but how difficult they may be to start answering? Yeah, I I really am big. I'll first say like on the simplicity of things, because we can really complicate things. Our mind has a master's degree in complicating things and creating problems 
to so to get it simple is I think probably where the most answers come from, but simple doesn't necessarily equate to easy. And so we have to understand though it seems simple, uh, it take takes some time to actually go through it and start to notice you in the process. So notice you doing you as uh, as a as a a way of um seeing, okay, how am I relating to this? What's coming up for me, even when I'm doing this? Okay. All right. Well, well, let me just notice that we can't do anything if we're not aware, you know? So big thing is that awareness piece. Um, and if something's really catching you up about it, um, you know, I would get curious and this is nice when you have someone else to reflect it with like a therapist or somebody kind of able to navigate it with you. But I like to understand like, well, what is the thought or belief that's surrounding what's catching you up? Like if it's a lot of time for uh, codependence, for an example, it's like the fear of rejection or fear of failure, or I don't know, right? Fill in the blank. So um, I'm really big on that. So then we can start to rewire the way that you're viewing that because behaviors, yes, will ultimately change the course of your life, but it starts with the thought. Right. And a lot of these actions are kind of stemming from a belief or a thought. So I'm really big on rewiring that. How can we see this from a different vantage point um, to get you to have some momentum and hope moving forward? Um, but but yeah, I think I steered it in a different direction, but I, I definitely think that if you were to allow yourself to be in the simpleness of it and take time for it and notice what's coming up for you as you engage in it, it could be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It took a while for me to become aware, like, oh, yeah. I, I'm like pleasing other people while I'm doing this. Like, and no one's that. watching me. <laughs> yeah. And like, okay. Um, yeah. So being aware of that. But prior to it, yeah, I just was doing a good job. And then, yeah, I think become, I mean, now, nowadays, yeah, I journal and it's me, myself, and I. So somehow with that awareness, obviously it slowly transitioned into like this like pure uh, reflective time. Yeah, but I definitely had to be aware of it before I could let it go. Or yeah, I just be pleasing all the journaling gods. So. <laughs> yeah, well, but you, you even use it, can I use your example? Yeah, and so you went through a process with it. And I, that's the point of having practices. You're not going to do it in the beginning of, oh my gosh, I know myself and I'm no longer this way. The practice is there so you can work through it mm -hmm. so that you can get to that right. other end. And so that could take a couple of weeks. That could take months, a year. I don't know. But the whole point is it's a practice to become somebody else in those moments. And I want to be careful. So maybe I can explain that verbiage a little bit. To become somebody else is... When, when we are, let's just say, being a way that's very codependent, there's certain ways of being, right, that we're engaging in. It's a skill. We become very good at it and we go to it very frequently. So it's very natural. Yeah. So if you're not thinking, you're going to go back to what's natural and common for you. So these practices are something to sit down and try to really focus on how to be a different way, build that new way of being, that new skill. Again, you're not changing complete identities. You're just stepping into a different character, characteristic trait. We have them all. They're always attainable and accessible to us, but certain ones we do not practice. As codependent, uh, when you're being codependent, I should say, there's certain things that you're really skillful in. Right. And then usually we want to go into the polar part of that, or at least a balanced version of it. Right. Cause not all of it's bad. It just needs to be navigated correctly. Mm -hmm. Like considering others is a really good characteristic. Please don't get rid of that. You know, you, that's a good quality for a good human. But um, when you're on one extreme of it, right, it tends to have really ineffective result, results for our lives. And so it's like, okay, how can I take this characteristic or this trait and navigate it in a way that is more balanced? Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for expanding on it. Yeah. All right.
So at your practice, how do you help your clients address their, well, let's start. Okay. How do you help them address poor boundary setting? But before how you help them address it, what, what does poor boundary setting look like? Oh gosh, it can look so many different ways. Um, and I think it depends on each person. Mm -hmm. But I think there's boundaries that one can cross that is harmful to someone in a situation, and that's really extreme, right? But there's also boundaries that one can cross because they're not aware of unknown, and it's more of a preference of the individual. Right. Right. Um, and so I want to approach those a little differently, right? Um, but all in all, I uh, go back and again to those values. So I think that's the theme of my conversation today. But it speaks to those roots that we were talking about earlier. And so I always, I always go to, well, what boundaries are you going to put up, and why? Why are you going to put them up? And because you can't expect someone to know what boundaries that they, they need to live by with you, there might be completely different. So we can't assume that someone should know, like we have to communicate that and we got to communicate it clearly. But first, in order to communicate that you have to understand where is it coming from with you? Because sometimes it's just reactive and you don't want to place a boundary out of reaction. You have to understand like, okay, Am I putting this boundary up to safeguard something that's really sacred for me? Or am I putting it up because something's bothering me and I don't want to look at it within myself mm. and, and I want the other person to, to deal with it. Right. right. And so, and, and we can, we can all get into that. Right. And, and some, sometimes it's hard to be really mindful all the time, but um, so first we look at the values and I really am clear about what values I set with my clients. So I have them like write out like a, a handful of them. And these are characteristics, again, going to those ways of being. So some principles are characteristics. So it has to be that character trait and not um, an entity in your life. So an example, it has to be something like courage or gratitude um, and not something like family. And I make that very distinct because we get to live in our, in those principles, those characteristics in those places of, with family. So I get to be grateful with my family, right? Those are, the, and there could be a priority in the different entities that I'm in. Like maybe it's family and then work, whatever it might be, but my values come from a way of being a characteristic. Mm -hmm. Another reason for that is because no one can take that away from you and no one can give it to you. You have to just choose it and access it. And choosing and accessing, again, isn't necessarily easy. It sounds simple, but it's really a practice of. Um, and so we'll have one's values that we're really good at practicing and we'll have some that are values and we're like, but I never practice it. <laughs> you know, so we can be, um, it can be difficult to access it. And so, uh, yeah, I have them list out what those words are and I have them define it and I have them define it in regards to what it means for them. Um, and this was something that was taught for me long ago from one of my mentors and it helped me a great deal. So I'm like, I, I can't not give this to others. Right. And so the moment they define it and then, uh, they start to put up parameters or practices in their life that will help sustain it. And so um, I'll give you an example uh, of one of mine. So one of mine is like kindness and kindness for me is loving, uh, loving myself and others. Right. And so being kind and loving myself and others and a way to practice that is maybe at the end of the day, uh, I write out a few things that I, that I'm grateful for that I stepped into. Right. So something loving towards myself. Um, or maybe it's one time a week, I'll, I'll phone a friend and just check in on them and see how they're doing. Right. It has, but I would say that that practice has to be something that is a challenge, you know? And so, um, another one of mine is, is gratitude. And I, I took this definition from a dear friend, but finding the gratitude is, um, finding the value in anything, no matter what. So that's how I define it. 
And so one of my practices in the very beginning of this was being mindful and not complaining. And I'll tell you in the beginning, I was like, I'm not a complainer. Girl, I was a complainer. Okay. I complain all the time. Like 90% <laughs> of the time, I think I'm complaining. I'm I complaining. was like complaining right now about how I complain so much. Yeah, that's that's a cycle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I know I'm fine. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is something for me to lean into, you know. So uh, it could be definitely humbling, but definitely something that could be so rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, there's nothing more empowering than going, okay, I can choose these things. I can access these things, you know, and it's okay that I'm not good at it. And, and then, so taking these values and then going, okay, now let me place my boundaries surrounding this because your values, you can be unwavering in how you show up in them but please be un i would say be wavering in the way that you are in it be unwavering in the way that you stand by it mm -hmm. so don't sway from being a person that lives in those values and that, i think that's when we know when we have to put up a boundary so going to the kindness one, if someone I'm around or if I'm tempted, if you will, to be unkind or unloving in any way that that like will show up in a situation, I will say, tell someone, ah, I can't engage in that or that's something I'm not going to allow. And so that's very clear to me. But again, I can be very wavering in how I show love and kindness, right? That there's a billion different ways. Right. But I think when... um we express ourselves to others and say, Hey, I'm going to put up this boundary or, you know, however it sounds right. Sometimes it's not so clear like that, but I know where I stand because it's something that I hold so sacred. And then I'm also able to articulate it to somebody. So they get it, you know? And, and so things become a little bit more clear as well. When you get that clear, mm -hmm. The issue is sometimes we're, we're again, like in survival mode when it comes to boundaries and we're, hey, don't do that or do that. And people are like, well, why? What's the deal? And you're like, I don't know. Just don't do it. <laughs> you know, right. it's not going to really hold any ground. Um, and another thing, going back to that conviction, if we don't know why we're not holding it, are we really going to be convicted? We can be reactive, but that's Reactive could be anger, frustration. That's different from being convicted. Convicted comes from a different place within you. People might not necessarily listen to anger and frustration. They might, but more so, and I'm not saying everyone, but more so people listen if you're convicted. Like if you, there's so many times going even to parenthood with my daughter, when I'm convicted, like if she's going to run across the street, that's busy. And I say, you can't do that. Those moments, she rarely fights it. She knows because she feels within my soul. Oh, well, okay. I'm going to listen. Mm -hmm. But then there's other times where I'm more reactive. Hey, don't do that. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forget about it. I can do what I want. Again, not a hundred percent of the time, but it, there's something just so, so powerful about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So starting with values, placing boundaries and you sense like as a consequence of that right? The, the main, the maintenance, right? That's like a third part of boundaries. So maintaining those boundaries like helps like with that formula, um, the poor boundaries like turn into like healthier, firm, strong ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So final question you have observed clients who, yeah, they have difficulty expressing themselves due to worry of being rejected. How do you help them express themselves 
despite that worry? Yeah, what are the initial steps you suggest? I always get curious first of the worry connected to rejection. Well, what is that worry for you, you know, as an individual? Again, going back to our thoughts or beliefs will direct our behavior, right? And so if we can see things from a different angle, could there be a space for you to step into differently? Mm-hmm. Um, Because the bottom line, we're going to get rejected. And and honestly, kind of hopefully, because that means that we're putting ourselves out there and being vulnerable, right? It comes with the consequence, putting, you know, making ourselves vulnerable to another. But if you don't make yourself vulnerable to another, you're not going to experience the beauty that comes with that. Like you will never get to the depths to somebody else if you don't do that. Intimacy will only go a certain way. And so allowing yourself to be in a position to get rejected is wonderful which is a weird way to put it. So, okay, what's the worry? And there's many different rational reasons why you would be worried about such thing. But can we put, and let's connect it to the values. Let's go there again. We'll do it to everything. But um, could you connect the reason why you're going to make yourself vulnerable enough to be rejected, connected to a value set of yours? Whether if that's connection, intimacy, love there's so much richness in that and i honestly it's okay to be worried we're gonna feel worried and but how do you navigate the extremeness that worry can carry sometimes right so that becomes more skillful so i always start with the thought let's see this differently because there's a way you're seeing it that's that's a difficult you for you to navigate moving forward and allowing yourself to to be in that space um and a lot of times when it's really hard it's usually connected to a belief about self which is connected to worth or you know things in that nature okay right and so it makes it really intense and and some people feel very immobile in it and and so I honestly am really big on, well, okay. Feelings are going to be there. They are. Some of them are intense. How can we work with them? But you can't let feelings dictate your life. Mm -hmm. And I think to a certain extent, we all do at times, like I, I I can put up my hand for that, like, (laughs) you know, but you got to learn how to navigate through it or else you're going to be missing some really beautiful things in life. But sometimes the feeling is, it like surpasses the skill that we know how to like work with it. We need to know how to, how do I work with this worry? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I I try to touch on all of those components when it comes to it, but really the meat is how can we see it differently? Mm -hmm. How can you see the relationship with rejection differently? You know, and so when we open up that door to seeing it from that different vantage point, people are more um, willing or at least more hopeful than they were before. And hopefulness is is beautiful in, the, in that you see you see a light at the end of the tunnel where before you didn't. Like there's actually options for you. Right. And I think that's big as clinicians, right? It's like a lot of times people come in very hopeless. And we want to get them to the place of feeling very hopeful and not in a, a lying or deceitful way of, but that always tells me, okay, the some way you're seeing this is allowing some doors to be closed off. And I, and I get that. Um, sometimes there's pain behind that, right? There's something a little deeper. Uh, sometimes that needs to be dealt with as well. Right. But, but yeah, I think. It's so powerful if you can allow yourself to to lean into that or at least admit like, oh, I'm I'm afraid of that rejection, right? Pretty radical. <laughs> How can we see the like the relationship, my relationship to rejection to rejection differently? Um 
What are your thoughts, Lauren, on like, right? I think before we consciously list out our values that can help um, help us set boundaries, express ourselves, like really be rooted in that. What if like prior to doing that, like, like we have values because we're obviously basing our behavior off them, but our values are comfort, harmony, mm, a lack of, I mean, like, yeah, like, oh gosh, I'm trying to think, but yeah, I, I think for codependence, like prior to knowing our values, we can have, we have values, but they tend to, yeah, be rooted in comfort, harmony, um, like cohesion, like keeping the peace. And so, yeah, your thoughts on, I, yeah, I guess like naming the values, it kind of sounds like it's like, like these exercises might be more about like naming the values we want to cultivate since we've already had some that aren't working. Yes. And you hit on such a good point because and maybe the distinction really is what are the values? There can be two set of values, right? There can be one of mindfulness, uh, abundance, if you will. And there's maybe another category of like a fear-based value. And so yeah. like, and some of them can, um, like you mentioned, like harmony, harmony sounds like a wonderful value, right? But how, how, like what, at what uh, foundation is it sitting on? So if you're doing an intentional value set, like the, the one I was explaining, like how would you define it in those terms rather than the fear? Um, and a lot of times, I think a lot of the decisions of fear come down to uh, like safety, comfort, like you mentioned, um, the approval of others or acceptance of others, control, you know, and so th those are things that we tend to really value when it comes to fear. Um, and so I think to be aware of like those two different categories. And so when you see yourself leaning into the feared ones, go, okay, at least let me acknowledge where I'm at. And there's something really powerful to go, okay, I'm, I'm scared. And I think there's something even more vulnerable to, to say that in distinction to, oh, there's this fear coming up. No, I'm scared. What am I scared of? I'm, I'm afraid of losing control. I'm afraid of somebody rejecting me. And there's something so powerful, just expressing that out loud and taking it to, again, those people within your arena. So they could hear you, see you, and then remind you of your truth. Time and time again, I'll go to my husband and go, I'm scared. <laughs> and he'll be like, let me listen. We've been with each other for a while, right? So we know how to work with each other. Let me listen. Let me hear you. And then now let me tell you your truth. Mm -hmm. This is who you are. Let me remind you where you're standing. And let, let me remind you that you're good. Okay. Now maybe that gives me enough. I don't know if it's substance or just umph to then go into, okay, what do I actually need to step into? Mm -hmm. Again, like these emotions and feelings won't go away, but how do I navigate them more effectively for my life and know how to work with it? Because these, they're all just moving different parts in us, but it's not who we are at our core. Mm -hmm. Who we are at a core, I guess, gets to navigate all of it. But sometimes we, we forget that and it consumes us. I, I always kind of give the the, the visual of like, if you were all in the car with all your different moving parts, like you want to be the one that's in the driver's seat guiding. But what happens is you'll get hijacked and all of a sudden you're in the back seat and the trunk going, oh, fear is driving me right now. <laughs> oh, hanger is, you know, <laughs> how, did, how did they get there? You know, so uh, yeah, I think it's just understanding ourselves and the we start to understand ourselves even more when we see these moving different parts and how we are with each moving different part. Um, yeah. And it takes time. It takes time. And we're not supposed to be good at it. We're supposed to learn how to be more effective with it, but we're not going to be good with it from the get-go. We're Again, we make things too complex. It's our human condition. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate distinguishing the two. Yeah. We could just say like the like less conscious values we've had and the more conscious values we're cultivating or yeah, yeah. really wanting to honor. Um, because yeah, I can be codependent and one of my values can be honesty, but that's probably something I'm working towards when deception and not, um, oh gosh. Yeah. Like not like causing any ripples that, that was my focus before. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. It's so powerful. And even to speak into that one, uh, um, a good practice for that, if it's like, okay, I value honesty and I notice that I'm disaligned here. Again, it, it doesn't mean that we're good at it. It just means that we want to start to live in it more because it gives this fulfillment. Think back to all the times where you felt the most fulfilled or alive or free. There's a way of being that you were in that it, you probably hold as a value. Mm -hmm. Right. So you could do some reflection on that piece. But but when it comes to honesty, starting starting to be aware when you're lying, you know, in the dis, the distinction between a lie of omission and a lie of deceit, like a lie of omissions, like uh, I'm working on air shells. I'm, I'm saying the half truth. I'm say I'm afraid to say the whole truth because ah, rejection, fear, whatever it might be. A lot of times we'll lie based off of that type of lie rather than being deceitful that or malicious, you know, right. usually that's not the case. But um, when you kind of have it in your mind, even for one week, like when am I lying? Like, again, it's very humbling and it doesn't mean you're a bad person, right? You're trying to work with yourself to improve. So it's like, okay, when, when am I lying? It's like, oh my gosh, when someone that I trust says, Hey, how are you doing? I'm like, great. Even though there's like a fire in the background <laughs> and like, you know, you're about to lose it. It's like, wait, I'm I'm not doing great. Of course, there's distinctions. We're not gonna tell a stranger, you know, how we're how we're feeling unless, hey, you're open to it. But if someone that you have that established love and trust with, uh, and you're you're noticing that, it's like, okay, let me not be hard on myself. Let me just notice it. And again, when there's awareness, then you can do something about it. Right. So then when you're aware, okay, I notice I held back there. Let me actually pause and rephrase. Actually, hold on. I'm not doing the greatest. Or even go back, you know, next time when they do ask and be more mindful of it. Right. And so all these different approaches, but again, so profound. And that and that can last the rest of your life. But read it, have it in the front of you. If you do these values, I would just say if anyone's open to it, read them daily. Read them daily until they start to take hold. Because whatever you put in your forefront, you will start to live into. And so, and that goes into awareness of what you're watching, what you're listening to, what you're seeing. Um, and there's nothing better to, to put into you rather than your values and actually what you want to live into um, and to be, you know, the best human that we could really be. We will end on that. <laughs> It's end. <laughs> yes. So Lauren, thank you so much for coming back and congratulations on your group practice for everyone who isn't familiar with what it takes. It takes so much. And yeah, thank you for opening up even about the process and someone decide for me, please. Very honest. <laughs> if people want to learn more about you, um, learn more about a new counseling and wellness, where can they go? Yeah, you can go to the website, www.anewcounselingandwellness.com. You can also go to the Instagram, though it's not really, I'm not really active on it, but I'll check it enough to know if you wrote, wrote on it and wanted to reach out. So that's a new counseling and wellness. Um, and, and yeah, you can email as well, Lauren at a new counseling and wellness.com. Okay. I will list all of that in the show notes and you are offering free therapy consultations for yes. those who reach out. Yeah. Free consultations. Um, and to really decide like, who's going to be the best match for you. You know, we have a few different clinicians, all wonderful, just the most beautiful souls, you know, and, and really good at their craft, you know, and so and they all have their specialties. So I really look at what you're wanting to work on 
Um, so the skill of the clinician to that specific thing that you want to work on also personality, because that is a thing and, you know, it's not a one fi uh, size fit all. Right. And so, um, and then also some are, can take certain insurances and some are out of network. So we look at all that to decide, you know, what's going to be the best course of action for you. Awesome. All right. So yes, again, I will put links to all of that in the show notes, everyone. Lauren, thank you for being here. Thank you for having Listener, me. Yes. Listener, thank you for being here and I will see you next week. Take care. Bye. Hey girl, it's Marissa again. I'm not like a regular podcaster. I'm a cool podcaster, right? Thank you for listening and staying till the end. You can find me on Instagram at therapy with Marissa. Email me marissa at codependummy.com check out codependummy.com for more information on the show and baby girl a subscribe rating and review would be much appreciated till next time i want you to remember if you are feeling unseen i see you if you are feeling unheard I hear you, and if you think that you don't matter, know that you matter to me. I want you to go out there so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. And now, the disclaimer. Girl, this is not therapy and I am not your therapist. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, or guests are rendering any legal, clinical, or other professional service. If you want or need a professional, please find one.